Welcome to Daedalus U. I'm Paul, coming to you from Brooklyn. Today we have an exciting new talk on Thoreau's civil disobedience called What Would Thoreau Do? In part one of this lecture, we're going to take a look directly at Thoreau's famous essay. And in part two, we're going to take a look at the history of civil disobedience in America and a look at civil disobedience today. So let's get started. Here is a picture of Thoreau unkempt. He was famously messy haired. Emerson, his good friend, called him ugly as sin, but said his ugliness suited him better than beauty. Briefly, a life. Thoreau was born in 1817 in Concord, Massachusetts, died at age 44 in 1862. He's most famous for, of course, Walden, his experiment of living uh, by Walden Pond and trying to explore the simple life. You can peruse the rest here, but we're going to focus on his essay, originally a lecture entitled Resistance to Civil Government. It was first published in May 1849. And Yes, it was conjured up after Thoreau spent a night in prison, having refused to pay his poll tax. Now, Thoreau did not write this essay while in prison. That's a common misconception. He did not spend a very long time in prison. That's another common misconception. He spent one night in prison and then was bailed out, uh, likely by his aunt. Uh, other sources say Emerson his good friend himself bailed him out. The point being, Thoreau exercised his power of civil disobedience by refusing to pay his poll tax for reasons we shall shortly see. And he was imprisoned for a night. And this experience gave rise to an entire philosophy of civil disobedience that has been admired and employed by such luminaries as the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi and others today. So let's take a look now at the essay itself. For the record, I will be reading from the Penguin Classics edition of both Walden and Civil Disobedience today, so the page numbers I cite are from the Penguin version. First, Thoreau's style is so fascinating, he uses a lot of personal observation, heavily rooted in his scholarship, his knowledge of history and literature. I'm going to pay close attention to his pointed rhetoric. He is a master at the rhetorical persuasive argument, and that's what I want to focus on in this talk how Thoreau manages to persuade us, in fact, that civil disobedience is not only legitimate, but necessary to a functioning democracy. So Thoreau is living at Walden Pond at the time he refuses to pay his poll tax. The year is 1846, and you could imagine the kindly tax collector finally finding Thoreau in his isolated cabin out by the pond knocking on his door and Thoreau coming to the door and saying, no sir, I refuse to pay my poll tax. The poor tax collector must have been aggravated for he must then bring Thoreau in and indeed Thoreau spends a night in jail for his refusal to pay the tax. Thoreau comes out of this experience, this night in jail, and is inspired to work on a new talk, which he calls Resistance to Civil Government. And he gives this talk over the next few years. And in the talk, Thoreau articulates his complaints. Number one, slavery. Thoreau is a lifelong abolitionist. He gave lectures across the country advocating for abolition, he supported the Underground Railroad. He supported John Brown in his radical efforts to end slavery. 
And number two, Thoreau disagrees with the United States' involvement in the Mexican War, and in fact, in their aggression in invading Mexico and starting this war under President James Polk. Thoreau is particularly concerned that the land grabs, right, that the territory that America gains through the Mexican War will give rise to the extension of slavery. So his two complaints are linked. And for this reason, Thoreau refuses to give his hard-earned dollar to the United States government so that it can perpetrate war and extend slavery. So let's now take a look at the text itself. The argument is well articulated in the opening lines of Thoreau's essay. I heartily accept the motto that government is best which governs least, and I should like to see it acted up to more rapidly and systematically. Carried out, it finally amounts to this, which I also believe, that government is best which governs not at all. And when men are prepared for it, that will be the kind of government which they will have. Note Thoreau's strong language. He asserts here that that government which governs not at all is best. And for this reason, many anarchists have claimed Thoreau as their own. And I tend to side with this more radical interpretation. As we read on, we see that Thoreau seemingly occupies more of a middle ground. He wants government for certain purposes and not for others. But my more radical interpretation is rooted in this rather mysterious phrase, when men are prepared for it. Thoreau says, when men are prepared for it, that is the kind of government we shall have, meaning no government. And in that sentiment, I sense a deep-rooted belief in a kind of evolution of man, the evolution of human consciousness and of conscience that will give rise to a time when all men and women can govern themselves based on the dictates of their own conscience. It's an idealistic vision, but it's one I like. So, regardless, the gauntlet is, is thrown here in the opening lines of the essay. Thoreau says we should have no government. And when mankind or humankind is ready, that is what we shall have. So notice his argument is rooted in an intense or radical individualism. The reason why no government is best is because man and his conscience is the single best guide. So let's take a look at the articulation of this radical individualism on page 387. I'll start at the top. But a government in which the majority rule in all cases cannot be based on justice even as far as men understand it. Can there not be a government in which majorities do not virtually decide right and wrong, but conscience? So you see, Thoreau is arguing that conscience is the supreme principle, not the majority. And he goes on, in which majorities decide only those questions to which the rule of expediency is applicable, must the citizen ever, for a moment, or in the least degree, resign his conscience to the legislator? Again, note Thoreau's strong language. It is, it is his intensity of rhetoric that has made his writing endure these many, many decades. He says, is there ever a moment, notice he, he, he poses it as a rhetorical question, he poses the thought, is there ever a moment when my personal conscience should be secondary to the legislator, to something government legislates. Why has every man a conscience then? 
Again, the argument is rooted in individualism and in the fact that every man and woman has a conscience of their own. Why would we have these consciences if not to use them to govern ourselves? And then here on the big board you see the most explicit articulation of individualism. I think that we should be men first and subjects afterward. It is not desirable to cultivate a respect for the law so much as for the right. The only obligation which I have the right to assume is to do at any time what I think right. So yes, it's idealistic. But the notion is, I have a conscience. I know what is right and wrong. And it is my right to do that, namely what I think is right or wrong. So let's look at how Thoreau thinks the current government actually treats men, actually treats the individual. Okay, You see here that he believes that the way government is structured now, men or the mass of men are treated like machines or dogs. So again, in these lines, listen to the power of his rhetoric, to the intensity of his imagery. The mass of men serve the state thus, not as men mainly, but as machines with their bodies. They are the standing army and the militia, jailers, constables. In most cases, there is no free exercise whatever of the judgment or of the moral sense. And they put themselves on a level with wood and earth and stones. Thoreau goes on, and wooden men can perhaps be manufactured that will serve the purpose as well. Such command no more respect than men of straw or a lump of dirt. They have the same sort of worth only as horses and dogs. Powerful language. We must not allow our government to treat us like a lump of dirt. Thoreau continues trying to now draw the image of a man who acts based upon his conscience. Yet such as these even are commonly esteemed good citizens, that is, the machines or the dogs. Others, as most legislators, politicians, lawyers, ministers, and office holders, serve the state chiefly with their heads, and as they rarely make any moral distinction, they are likely to serve the devil without intending it as God. A very few, as heroes, patriots, martyrs, reformers in the great sense, are men, serve the state with their consciences also and so necessarily resist it for the most part, and they are commonly treated as enemies by it. So, there you have it. Men who use their conscience, women who employ their consciences, are most likely to be in a relationship of resistance over and against the state. Hmm by nature. So then, what to do? Well, Thoreau is clearly working within the tradition of the Founding Fathers, uh, who of course uh, recognized the right to revolution, as articulated by Thomas Paine, by John Locke, by Jefferson and Madison, etc. And Thoreau is going to give us this argument yet again. Let's see on page 389. All men recognize the right of revolution, that is, the right to refuse allegiance to and to resist the government when its tyranny or its inefficiency are great and unendurable. So the logic is simple. When the government is perpetrating great and unendurable tyrannies, evils, wrongdoings, such as slavery or the Mexican War in Thoreau's case, the right to revolution is the paramount principle. The key to Thoreau's strategy is action. We must act. He says on page 
395, unjust laws exist. Right? They do. Shall we be content to obey them? Or shall we endeavor to amend them and obey them until we have succeeded? Or shall we transgress them at once? So here again, we see how readers of Thoreau interpret him as a radical because he doesn't so much go in for the middle way here, namely obey them until we have succeeded amending them. Or shall we transgress them at once? Thoreau recommends we transgress them at once. He says, I quote, I say, break the law. So next, Thoreau, the wise philosopher that he is, begins to look at some counter arguments, right? And, and, and he begins to sort of pick apart counter arguments. And a big one is voting. Right? People say, well, in a democracy, you have a voice. You can vote. You can vote for representation, who then can vote to change the laws that you disagree with. But look here. Thoreau says on the big board, all voting is a sort of gaming. And he says, even voting for the right is doing nothing for it. Notice how doing is italicized here. The key for Thoreau is action. This is a powerful interpretation of democracy. Voting is a sort of game. And certainly in our money-infused, high spectacle, sort of TV world, of elections in the modern age. I think Thoreau's view has been proven. It's kind of a big game and there is actually no action in it. So what kind of action then does Thoreau suggest? Well, his strategy, as we have mentioned, is to not pay one's taxes. Turn to page 407 and see how Thoreau begins, or continues, I should say, to sort of address counter arguments. He says, I have never declined paying the highway tax because I am as desirous of being a good neighbor as I am of being a bad subject. Right, so one may say, but you like good roads, don't you? You like when the state or city or federal government fixes your potholes or builds a new interstate, right? You enjoy these benefits of civilized society. And Thoreau says, sure, I've always paid my highway tax. Now, of course, we don't quite have the same distinction between a highway tax and poll tax. We generally pay, uh, you know, uh, federal income tax and then, you know, various uh, taxes at the cash register and so forth. Um, but Thoreau's point is, I like the highways. I pay that tax. He goes on. And as for supporting schools, I'm doing my part to educate my fellow countrymen now. So he believes in schools. He believes in uh, public education. Uh, and he specifically believes that he himself, in his lecturing and writing, is doing his part there. He goes on. It is for no particular item in the tax bill that I refuse to pay it. So that's slightly different from what I've been saying, right? All along through this essay, we've been kind of assuming that Thoreau's specific grievances are the Mexican War and slavery. But he broadens his argument here. And listen to how he does so. He says, it is for no particular item in the tax bill that I refuse to pay it. I simply wish to refuse allegiance to the state, to withdraw and stand aloof from it effectually. Hmm. I do not care to trace the course of my dollar, if I could, till it buys a man or a musket to shoot one with. The dollar is innocent. But I am concerned to trace the effects of my allegiance. In fact, I quietly declare war with the state. 
So Thoreau doesn't care if his dollar buys another soldier or another musket for the soldier, but in one way, shape, or form, that dollar he believes is going to support a war and probably the extension of slavery, and he does not abide, right? So he refuses to pay his taxes. And there we have this sort of incipient moment in the history of civil disobedience, of a man standing up saying, I disagree with what my government is doing and I will act. I will not wait till the next election cycle. I will not wait for these bills to be amended through Congress. I will act. I will not pay my poll tax. Thoreau sees this money, his tax dollar, inextricably tied up with state violence. And he gives us yet another powerful quote on page 399. If a thousand men were not to pay their tax bills this year, that would not be a violent and bloody measure, as it would be to pay them and enable the state to commit violence and shed innocent blood. That, in a nutshell, in a very condensed fashion, is Thoreau's argument. As you see here up on the big board, Gandhi agrees, of course, civil disobedience becomes a sacred duty when the state becomes lawless and corrupt. This brings us to the end of part one of this talk. I hope, you've been, I hope you have enjoyed our investigation of Thoreau and his powerful and enduring essay, Civil Disobedience. In the next talk, we're going to look at a history of civil disobedience in the United States and talk about how civil disobedience is relevant still today. Thank you for joining me. Please tune into the next talk, and I'll see you in the future.